Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just a, a couple of uh, maybe points in response to some things that were said here on the floor. Uh, the notion that somebody who leaves, say, a, a school district uh, and then comes back is somehow not going to get into their uh, prior benefit plan is just untrue. Those rules are not changed at all. Um, and I, I have heard a, a fair amount about how the, the future higher benefit is, is uh, you know, it's not significant, I guess. So think about it this way. First of all, we're not talking about a 401k plan. The employee is going to have to put 3% into the cash balance, 3% into the defined contribution plan at a minimum. They can put in more. And uh, for the state system, they're going to have to put in this, the taxpayer is going to have to put in 4%. Can't take out any loans on that. A lot of people get in trouble with these DC plans because they take out loans, emergency withdrawals. You're not allowed to do that. And this plan is fundamentally portable. So Pew did an analysis of uh, PSERS and, and SERS and found that in a very short period of time, many of our teachers and many of our state employees leave state service and don't come back. And under a defined benefit plan like the one we have, those individuals are treated very badly. They put a lot of skin in the game and they walk away with all, all they walk away with is what they put in, plus basically 4%. And that's not fair, but that's how defined benefit plans often are. They're backloaded so that the long-term employee, the 30 or 35-year employee, is the one who significantly benefits. But that's not the way today's world is. Pew did an analysis and found uh, that many of our employees leave after a fairly short period of time. There was testimony in the state government committee that the average state worker across the country only serves in state government for about seven years. And under our current plan, it's not fair to them. Pew took a look at those benefits under a hybrid plan, a DC and a, and a, and a cash balance, and found that they were actually better for future hires than the plan that we currently have for somebody who's in the system for 10 or 15 or 20 years. So fairness is often in the eyes of the beholder, and in today's world, it seems to me that a hybrid plan or a defined contribution plan, which is proper, properly crafted, is actually better for our employees of all kinds. They also found that uh, even for the long-term employees, and these are people that are going to retire in 30 or 40 years, they'll have uh, upwards of 50 or 60 percent replacement income, and you put that with uh, Social Security, 25, 30 percent, that's right in the range where they need to be. So this new higher benefit is a good benefit, despite what you've heard from some individuals on the floor. You also heard some comment about uh, how there are no savings in this plan for this year's budget. Um, I, you know, I looked at the analysis from PERC and from the actuaries, and the savings for any reform, especially of a system this size, takes time to implement. It doesn't mean it's not worth doing it. But we're fortunate. The analysis indicates that next year, in next year's budget, we're going to be north of $100 million in savings. That's $100 million that the taxpayer does not have to put in to our current pension system. That's important, and it goes up from there. 100, 150 million, a couple of hundred million in each budget year. That is nothing to ignore, and overall it saves us about $10 billion. There's some notion out there that it increases the unfunded liability on SERS. Not true, and in fact, if you read the consulting actuary for PERC, they made it quite clear the reason why it looks like there's an increase in the unfunded liability for SERS is because SERS somehow calculates that their cost, once we change this, will be zero. Well, we know their cost for an employee isn't zero. Right now it's four, five, six percent, and that's how they're calculating it. So it's really just a matter of, uh, you know, actuarial science that it appears the unfunded liability goes up in one actuary's report, but in Milliman's, in the consulting actuary for PERC, uh, they don't buy that, they criticize that uh, concept heavily, and they have for the several years we've been doing this. 
And then I, then I guess, uh, really lastly, I just want to conclude by saying, you know, this is, as I started out, a compromise bill. We do want to have a good benefit for our current hires. We do want to have a good benefit for our future hires. This bill balances that with the need for savings in a system which is obviously heavily stressed. What it does is it generates $10 billion in savings and savings starting next year, which is real. But in the overall liability for the next 30 years, we are still going to owe as taxpayers, as residents of the Commonwealth, a couple of hundred billion dollars for our current employee complement. And when you reduce that by about 10 billion, that's about a five or six percent impact for our current employee complement. It is not the doomsday. Somehow we are affecting current employees so that they will be on the doorstep after retirement and have no resources. Not at all. It is a compromise that balances savings with a commitment to our current hires, to our current employees. It is the right compromise, and I ask you to support Senate Bill 1. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.